after the therapeutic uses of atropine, we go further to know the contraindications to the use of atropine. We just discussed it increases the intraocular pressure. Obviously, it's contraindicated in acute congestive glaucoma. It will be contraindicated in patients with retention of urine. And I hope you remember benign prosthetic hyperplasia, which is a condition associated with retention of urine. So we also don't use it in patients with benign prosthetic hyperplasia. It's contraindicated in chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases because we said it dries the respiratory secretion and forms the thick tenacious mucus plugs in the respiratory tract which is going to add to the discomfort of the patient. So we don't give it in chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like bronchial asthma, bronchitis and bronchiectasis. So also, you are going to have the hazardous effects in patients who are at extremes of age to young patients and to old patients. We don't give atropine. So that are the contraindications for the use of atropine. I would like to remind you of a very important quote which describes the overdose with atropine. It's called dry as a bone, there's extreme dryness, red as meat because there's vasodilation, dissipation of heat producing redness, hot as iron, I remind you of the hyperpyrexia in atropine overdose, blind as a bat because the patient is going to suffer from blurriness of vision and mad as a hatter because atropine crosses blood brain barrier and stimulates the CNS and leads to confusion and disorientation. Just to repeat it, dry as a bone, red as meat, hot as iron, blind as a bat and mad as a hatter. How to manage the atropine poisoning? Let me remind you, atropine is a muscarinic blocker. It is a competitive antagonist of acetylcholine and it's blocked the muscarinic receptors. You need to give something which will act like acetylcholine and we have a very important drug, neos not neostigment, sorry, it's physostigment because neostigment doesn't cross blood brain barrier and physostigment is able to cross the blood brain barrier. Both of them are anticholinistic agents, but neostigment, poor CNS penetration, physostigment, better CNS penetration. It will be anticholinesterase, it will cross the blood brain barrier, go inside the CNS, inhibit the cholinesterase enzyme, and try to accumulate acetylcholine. And this acetylcholine is going to displace the atropine which has blocked the muscarinic receptor sites. So since Pfizer's statement is able to reverse also the CNS effects of atropine overdose because of its property of crossing the blood-brain barrier, Pfizer's statement is preferred as the drug of choice for treating atropine overdose. Atropine is a substance which we said in the beginning does not have selectivity between the muscarinic receptor sites. And this is why we need to know what's the, what's the need of atropine substitutes. Let, let us look at the disadvantages of atropine on this slide. Number one, no selectivity within the M1, M2 and M3 receptors. Hence, you get unwanted A oblique E is adverse effects. You get unwanted adverse effects. You get a good effect at one particular site which is desired but you also start blocking the other receptor sites and the, that's why you get the unwanted adverse effects. In addition to this, when atropine is added in the eye as a mitriatic, it's got a very long duration of action. The mitriasis and cycloplegia may take 5 to 7 days to subside and the patient will keep on suffering from blurriness of vision and photophobia. These are the disadvantages of atropine. And to overcome these drawbacks, we have synthesized certain atropine substitutes. These are the derivatives of atropine and we call them as atropine substitutes. Look at the slide, you will know the advantages of the atropine substitutes. Number one, they are comparatively selective within the muscarinic receptor sites. So there are some atropine substitutes mainly acting on the M1 receptors, few others mainly acting on the M3 receptors, so on and so forth. So that's the selectivity within muscarinic receptor sites. And this is why there are minimal adverse effects on the other sites and this is definitely better using a selective drug rather than a non-selective drug. So also we have got atropine substitutes which could be useful in the eye and produce the matriasis and cycloplegia for a short duration so that your patient who is coming for ophthalmologic examination is not going to suffer from blurriness of vision and photophobia for a long period of time. So matriasis and cycloplegia will last for a shorter time with the atropine substitutes. Let's go one by one to know the names that have 
too many names and you need to remember the names, the atropine substitutes. The first group of atropine substitutes is used as antispasmodics. Now I hope you remember the action of atropine is to relax the smooth muscle. These antispasmodics are useful in pain due to peptic ulcer, are useful in the colicky pain in abdomen. One of the important agents is pirenzepine, which is a selective M1 blocker and it's useful in peptic ulcer. You also have propanthylin, methanthylin, oxyphenonium bromide, dicyclamine and hyosin butyl bromide. All of them are important and they are frequently used in colicky pains. The next group is the drugs useful for urinary incontinence. The atropine substitutes useful to manage the urinary incontinence and urinary urgency. And you have two drugs here. The first one is oxybutynin and the second one is tolterotin. Tolterotin is more selective at the M3 receptors. You also have propivarin which could be used to treat the urinary incontinence or urinary urgency. And when the sphincter pupil is paralyzed, it's not going to produce any change in the size of the pupil. It's just going to remain a lax muscle. But this muscle is under parasympathetic control, cholinergic control, and the other muscle, radial muscle of iris, is under sympathetic control. So you can understand both of them are sitting in the eye and they are working together. And when the radial muscle of iris, which is under sympathetic control, understands that the circular muscle of iris is paralyzed, is lax, the radial muscle of iris is a sympathetic muscle, it's There are atropine substitutes useful in Parkinson and the names are benztropine and benzhexal. Benzhexal is also called trihexyphenidyl and this name is very frequently used and you got to remember this name trihexyphenidyl. You also have orphenidine and you have cycrimine, procyclidine and bipyridine. What is the speciality of the atropine substitutes useful in Parkinson? They are useful as the adjuncts to the other treatment modalities. The patient might be receiving other drugs for Parkinson and atropine substitutes could serve as very important and useful adjuncts. So also, when the issue comes to the drug induced Parkinson in which levodopa is not much useful, the drug of choice is the anticholinergic drugs that is the atropine substitutes. So please remember for drug induced Parkinson we have atropine substitutes and important one out of this is trihexyphenidyl. Atropine substitutes have been thought about in detail 
and there's an atropine substitute useful as pre-anesthetic medication. Let me remind you, we said atropine is useful as pre-anesthetic medication because it prevents the reflex vehicle priority cardia, is going to decrease the secretions, is going to relax the smooth muscles, is going to prevent the laryngospasm, prevent the nausea, vomiting and decrease the gastric hydrochloric acid secretion. In place of atropine, we have a new agent called glycopyrrolate and that's very frequently used, very widely used as pre-anesthetic medication. What's different than atropine? Number one, glycopyrrolate does not cross blood brain barrier. So you don't have to worry about the central nervous system effects and the central nervous system adverse effects. Glycopyrrolate also is known to produce less tachycardia as compared to atropine. And this is why glycopyrrolate is more preferred as a pre-anesthetic medication. As far as the motion sickness is concerned, you have scopolamine or hyacine which is available as a patch. Patch of 1.6 mg which is applied behind the pinna of the ear and has got a long duration of action of 3 days. As far as hyacine or scopolamine is concerned, you have another salt of hyacine that's hyacine butyl bromide or n butyl hyacine bromide and this one is useful to relax the smooth muscle in conditions like abdominal colic and before the radiological procedures of gastrointestinal tract when you want the smooth muscle of the stomach and colon to be relaxed. So that's a special use of hyacine butyl bromide. So that was about the muscarinic blockers. Just to summarize in muscarinic blockers we discussed atropine, we discussed hyacine or scopolamine and we discussed all other atropine substitutes which are more selective in action. Now we move on to the nicotinic blockers. Let me remind you of the nicotinic receptor sites. Number one is the skeletal neuromuscular junction. The next one is arctomic ganglia and the third one is adrenal medulla. The drugs which are going to block the ganglia are called ganglion blocking agents and the drugs which are going to act on the skeletal muscle are going to be the skeletal muscle relaxants. Let's have a look at the classification. Nicotinic blockers. Watch this slide. Ganglionic blocking agents is trimethophan mecabylamine and these are rarely used now and you are going to have the skeletal muscle relaxants. They are also called neuromuscular blockers because they are competitive antagonists of acetylcholine. You have the older agent D-tubocuronine and in the newer agents you have pancuronium, vacuronium. So that's the main classification of the nicotinic blockers. Now we concentrate on the skeletal muscle relaxants and as far as you think of skeletal muscle there's not only the nicotinic blockers, there are going to be other agents acting by other mechanisms who are going to relax the skeletal muscle. So, we deviate a bit, we go more, deep, more in details on the nicotinic blockers and we enter a chapter of the skeletal muscle relaxants. The skeletal muscle relaxants could be classified as, have a look at the slide, number one, peripherally acting, that's in the region of the muscle and the skeletal neuromuscular junction. One is your nicotinic blocker, which, just, which we just mentioned. That's the neuromuscular blockers or competitive antagonist. d 2 bacuronium, pancuronium, vacuronium, etracurium, etc. The next group is going to be the partial agonist or depolarizing agents. And that's your succinylcholine, a short acting agent. The next group is going to be directly acting on the muscle. And that's dantrolin. And lastly, there could be centrally acting agents who are acting on the central nervous system and producing skeletal muscle relaxation. You have benzodiazepines, example is diazepam. You have drugs from mefenesin group, that's chlorzoxazone. You have central alpha-2 agonist, that's tizanidine. And you have baclofen, which is a GABA B agonist. So that's the main classification for the skeletal muscle relaxants. And we start discussing the peripherally acting agents and the most important group of agents in consideration are the nicotinic blockers. These are the competitive blockers of the nicotinic receptor. And whatever is the block, the competitive block produced by these agents is going to be reversed by hydrophonium and neostigmin. Just a reminder to you from the previous chapter of the anticholinistase agents. Competitive blockers block the nicotinic receptor. They are classified into lung acting intermediate acting and short acting. The slide is telling you the names. Long acting, cis-atracurium and pancuronium. 
could have the duration of action of 40 to 80 minutes. Intermediate acting is atracurium, vecuronium, rocuronium, and detubocurarin. Detubocurarin acts for about half an hour to one hour, and rest of the agents act for 20 to 40 minutes. Please let me tell you, these are the most frequently used agents because they are giving you a duration of action which is not too short and which is not too long. That's the intermediate action, 20 to 40 minutes. If you look at this slide and come to atricurium, I want to remind you of something. This follows the Hoffman elimination. We have discussed this in, on the general pharmacology module. Hoffman elimination is spontaneous molecular rearrangement. And this is why there is an importance of this atricurium. If the patient is suffering from hepatic disease, renal disease, or the patients who are neonates or old age patients who don't have an adequately developed liver, you could still give atricurium to them because its elimination is not going to be affected. Atricurium will work as fine as in the other situations. So atricurium Hoffman elimination, just a reminder. The last line on the slide is the short acting agents and I have highlighted it with a blue color to make you remind Mivacurium it acts for 12 to 20 minutes. This is the shortest acting skeletal muscle relaxant which is acting by competitive blockade. The shortest acting skeletal muscle relaxant acting by competitive blockade is Mivacurium. The newer competitive blockers, the newer neuromuscular blockers are Pancuronium, Vacuronium, Rocuronium, Etricurium, Mivacurium, etc. And what are the advantages? When we say advantages, we are comparing these drugs with the older agent, that's detubocurarine. I hope you know detubocurarine is one of the important agents which releases histamine inside the body. And when you get release of histamine, you get the effects of histamine. You wanted this drug to relax the skeletal muscle, is doing it, but at the same time, it's releasing histamine. And histamine can produce bronchospasm, and histamine can produce vasodilation and fall in the blood pressure, that's hypertension. So, for d tubercularin this hypertension and bronchospasm become very important issues. Coming back to the newer competitive blockers, their advantage is they release histamine in a minimal amount. So, the problem of the hypertension and bronchospasm is going to be minimal. So, also, there's almost no or minimal ganglionic cardiac or vascular effects. This is what I said. They are not going to produce hypertension. Most of the agents, the newer competitive blockers are comparatively short acting and that's why the reversal becomes easy. And I am highlighting two names, atricurium and cis atricurium, which are likely to be more commonly used, especially when the patient suffers from hepatic damage, renal damage or the neonates or, and the old patients. And the reason is these two drugs have got Hoffman elimination. What are the uses of the competitive blockers? They will be used as adjuvants to anesthesia, general anesthesia, because you want adequate skeletal muscle relaxation that's optimal for your surgery. They are also used in the patients who are in the intensive care units for a long time and who are critically ill, because these patients will be on assisted ventilation. And you use the skeletal muscle relaxants to reduce the chest wall resistance to the inflation. This is a very important use and you use it in critically ill patients in the ICU who are on assisted ventilation. Competitive blockers can sometimes be used to prevent convulsions and trauma from the electroconvulsive therapy. So also they can be used to stop the convulsions in conditions like tetanus and status epilepticus if your other modalities of treatment are not working. As far as the drug interactions of the skeletal muscle relaxants are concerned, they produce an additive effect with other drugs which have got a similar effect on the skeletal neuromuscular junction. And the important agents are halothane, enfluren and ether. These two agents can have a curative mimetic effect, meaning thereby effect like detubocurarin, nothing but blocking the muscarinic receptor. So the muscle relaxants have got this effect, halothane, enfluren, ether also do have this effect. If you give them together, the effects are going to get added and that's called additive effect. The second group of substances you must remember is aminoglycoside antibiotics which have got the same effect neuromuscular blockage. 
So suppose if the patient is on aminoglycoside antibiotic for a long period of time and receives a skeletal muscle relaxants, a competitive blocker that can be excess neuromuscular blocker. Let's come to the adverse effects of nicotinic blockers. As I said, many of them they release histamine. So hypertension and cardiovascular collapse, bronchospasm and precipitation of bronchial asthma because there's vasodilation, there could be flushing, especially with detubal curarine, atrial curium and mevacurium curium are the newer ones. But they're also known to produce flushing and there'll be neuromuscular blockage leading to respiratory paralysis and apnea. Malignant hypothermia, the last one shown on this slide, is also a known adverse effect of nicotinic blockers, but it's less common with nicotinic blockers as more common with succinylcholine. So these were the competitive blockers. Now we go to the next group of agents, that's depolarizing agents. And there's one important agent to discuss is succinylcholine. This succinylcholine produces two types of blocks. One is called phase 1 block and the another one is called phase 2 block. In the phase 1, it reacts with the receptor at the muscle end plate, that's your nicotinic receptor, and produces depolarization of the excitable membrane. So does it act like an agonist? Yes, it acts like an agonist. But the problem is, its intrinsic activity is less. What do we call such an agent? We call it a partial agonist. So succinylcholine is a partial agonist. In the phase 1, it combines with the receptor and initiates the action which is of less intrinsic activity and that's why what you see in the periphery actually is the fasciculations. So there's a mild fasciculations, mild feeble contractions showing that it's a partial agonist. What happens during the phase 2 is after succinylcholine has done this action, the receptor sensitivity is diminished, is decreased and it's called desensitization block. So it's a partially agonist, produces initial fasciculations and then makes the receptor insensitive, leading to flaccid paralysis of the muscle. So that's called phase 2 block. So phase 1 block is the depolarization with less intrinsic activity leading to fasciculations and phase 2 block is the desensitization block when the membrane remains non-responsive to any further stimulus and this is why the muscle remains in a relaxed state. So that's about the mechanism of action of succinylcholine. Succinylcholine is a partial agonist and as you know there are cholinesterase enzymes in the plasma as well as in the tissues. They are there to destroy succinylcholine. So that's why you get a very rapid onset of action. That's within 1 to 1.5 minutes you start get, getting beginning of the action and the duration of action is very short that's 8 to 10 minutes this is due to the rapid breakdown by the plasma cholinesterase so we have a beautiful drug starting its effect within 1 to 1 and half minutes and ending the effect within 8 to 10 minutes this is why this drug becomes an ideal agent for rapid endotracheal intubation and that's the most common use of succinylcholine for rapid endotracheal intubation which is required during the induction of anesthesia so also it is useful for short procedures like laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, esophagoscopy, reductions of fractures and reductions of dislocation and to treat the laryngospasm. Succinylcholine could also be useful to prevent the events which happen during the electroconvulsive therapy and it will be helpful to relax the skeletal muscle. What are the unwanted effects of succinylcholine? You see them on the slide in red color. If the patient has deficiency of inactivating enzyme, which we discussed in pharmacogenetic factors, there's a prolonged muscle relaxation, the skeletal muscles of respiration get paralyzed and the diaphragm gets paralyzed and the patient starts suffering from apnea. And this is classically called succinylcholine apnea. If the succinylcholine apnea it tells you that this patient probably has a typical cholinesterase enzyme, you need to supply this enzyme which is not possible and you treat this patient by giving fresh blood transfusion. Blood is going to supply the cholinesterase enzyme and is going to destroy the succinylcholine which is accumulated. In addition, you give artificial respiration. So in few words, deficiency of the inactivating enzyme leading to succinylcholine apnea treat with fresh blood transfusion and artificial respiration. The second unwanted effect of succinylcholine is known is malignant hyperthermia and muscle rigidity. This is also produced by halothane. So halothane and succinylcholine together could increase the chances of malignant hyperthermia. To treat the malignant hyperthermia, you need external cooling and you need dantrolene, 
which is a directly acting skeletal muscle relaxant because it blocks the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It decreases the heat production and relaxes the muscle tone. So after succinylcholine apnea, the second adverse effect of succinylcholine is malignant hypothermia. Going to the next slide, succinylcholine is known to produce hyperkalemia due to the increased potassium release from the intracellular stores. This could precipitate cardiac arrhythmia and this could also precipitate the post-operative muscle soreness. You need to remember an important drug interaction, succinylcholine and thiopental, they are not compatible with each other if they are mixed in a syringe or mixed in an infusion. So that's regarding the adverse effects and drug interaction. We now move to one important thing because we did neuromuscular blockers, we did depolarizing agents. Let's compare between d tubercularine, the traditional, the prototype neuromuscular blocker and a depolarizing agent, succinylcholine. Now, let's do one thing. Let's compare the competitive blockers and the depolarizing agents, d tubercularine and succinylcholine. d tubercularine is a competitive blocker and succinylcholine is a depolarizing blocking agent. d tubercularine is a competitive antagonist whereas succinylcholine is a partial agonist. If you use neostigmine, the neostigmine can reverse the block produced by D-tubercurarin, which is called post-operative decurarization. As far as succinylcholine is concerned, neostigmine does not produce a significant effect. If there is vagal stimulation, the D-tubercurarin block could be reversed and again in case of succinylcholine, there is no effect. D-tubercurarin is known to release histamine and succinylcholine releases only slight amount of histamine. D2 bucurarin could produce ganglionic blockage because it's a receptor blocking agent whereas succinylcholine in other words is a cholinergic agent and that's why it can it could produce ganglionic stimulation. Due to the histamine release with D2 bucurarin you could have hypertension, asthma, flushing and bronchospasm. With succinylcholine you don't get all these effects because the release of the histamine is very very slight. As far as D-tubercurarin is concerned, we already discussed ether and enflurin can accentuate the block because they have got similar actions. Whereas with succinylcholine, there will be no accentuation of this block. If D-tubercurarin is used, that is a competitive blocker is used, there are no fasciculations and there is flaccid paralysis. Whereas with succinylcholine, because it is a partial agonist, you will have initial fasciculations followed by the flaccid paralysis. The order of paralysis in case of D-tubercularin is fingers first, then eyes and limbs, then neck, face, trunk and respiratory muscles. In case of succinylcholine, it is neck first and then limbs, face, jaw, eyes, pharynx, then the trunk and then finally respiratory muscles. Of course, D-tubercularin has a long duration of action of 15 to 40 minutes and succinylcholine is short acting, that's 8 to 10 minutes. The onset of effect for D-tubercurin will also be slow and it will be 4 to 6 minutes whereas for succinylcholine it will be just 1 to 1 and a half minutes. D-tubercurin is non, not known to precipitate arrhythmia whereas succinylcholine can produce cardiac arrhythmia. We use the neuromuscular blockers as adjuvants in longer surgeries and for tetanus and status epilepticus. Succinylcholine is used for more briefer procedures like endotracheal intubation various copies like laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, etc. and also during ECT. Important effect with d tubercularin is malignant hypothermia and with succinylcholine you can get the atypical pseudocholine stress enzyme leading to apnea and DPKN number becomes an important investigation for such patients. So malignant hypothermia is known to be caused by both the agents but it's more common with succinylcholine. If you have d tubercularin toxicity, we need to use neostigmine. Along with this, we need to use atropine to block the muscarinic receptors. And for succinylcholine toxicity, we use artificial respiration and the fresh blood transfusion. The last group of peripherally acting agents is directly acting agents and that's dantrolene. It has got a direct action on the skeletal muscle and it acts on the rhinodyne receptor RYR calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It prevents the opening of the calcium channels and this drug could be used by oral route or per oral, oral route of administration to reduce the spasticity 
in various disorders like upper motor neuron paralysis, hemiplegia, paraplegia, cerebral palsy, and multiple sclerosis. And as we just discussed, it's a drug of choice for malignant hypothermia because of its property of blocking the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you remember, we classified the skeletal muscle relaxants into peripherally acting and centrally acting. The centrally acting agents are from mefenicin group. You can have a look at the examples in the slide. Benzodiazepines, central alpha-2 agonist in the form of tizanidine, and baclofen, which is a selective GABA B agonist. Baclofen is an agent which, which acts by G protein coupled receptor, increases potassium conductance and alters the calcium flux. And the primary site of action is spinal cord. It's useful in various conditions like spasticity, multiple sclerosis, so on and so forth. The uses of centrally acting agents are spatial. They are going to relax the skeletal muscle by central action and they are useful in acute muscle spasms. They are also useful in conditions like torticollis, lumbago, backache and neuralgia and various conditions like hemiplegia, paraplegia or multiple sclerosis as well as they are useful in tetanus, status epilepticus and spasticities. DBK and Dumber was something which I mentioned during the table of d 2 and succinyl choline. What is Dibucane number? Under standardized test condition, Dibucane is able to inhibit the normal pseudocholinesterase enzyme 80% and the abnormal enzyme about 20%. So if you could give Dibucane to the patient and find out what's the inhibition, then you could know if this patient is having abnormal pseudocholinesterase enzyme. The normal value in the patients is 73 to 90 percent. This test is called Dibuchian number and this test could be used to detect if the patient suffers from abnormal pseudocholinesterase enzyme which is going to have a significance in case of succinyl choline. So this was the summary of all the skeletal muscle relaxants with which we also discussed nicotinic blockers.